And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney. President, officer, I welcome this opportunity to make a statement on the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. A key principle of Scottish education is that assessment is an essential part of our approach to learning. It allows teachers to understand pupils' progress and to plan the next phase of their learning and teaching. Assessment is therefore a key tool to inform teachers' professional judgment of the needs of the pupils they are teaching. Almost all local authorities in Scotland have been making use of some form of standardised assessment for a number of years. By having national assessments, we can now ensure that a consistent approach has been taken, which greatly helps in ensuring effective moderation of standards throughout the country, a crucial component of our determination to deliver excellence and equity for all. The value of assessment was set out last week by Professor Sue Ellis of the University of Strathclyde when she said, we know that there is a big difference in children's attainment when they start school, and that difference grows and gets wider as children move through the school system. So we do need some way of tracking that and checking it. Most councils in Scotland already had P1 assessments and have had them for some years. In fact, the majority didn't simply carry out one assessment of P1 pupils, they did it twice at different points during the year. The reason for that was teachers found them a useful source of information for tracking and checking the progress of pupils that Sue Ellis mentions, and then for planning future teaching and learning to meet the needs of individual pupils. The national assessments are simply a consistent tool to provide the same information to teachers. Unlike the old assessments, the Scottish National Standardised Assessments are better aligned to Curriculum for Excellence, making the reports that teachers receive even more valuable. On average, the P1 assessments take 22 minutes for numeracy and 27 minutes for literacy. Delivered as part of routine classroom activity, they should not place children under any undue stress. Last week, I published our user review of the assessments first year. That drew on a range of co comments and feedback, and I would like to highlight some key points. 578,000 assessments were carried out across P1, P4, P7 and S3, and I would like to thank pupils and staff for all of their efforts. This number represents around 94% of the total number of possible assessments, which I think strikes the appropriate balance between the presumption that the majority of pupils will undertake the assessments and the exercise of teacher judgment about whether it is in the best interest of an individual child to participate. The user review received a range of comments. We know that many teachers find the reports on how children have done to be very useful with high quality diagnostic information on the strengths and challenges of individual young people. We know that many children and young people found the assessments a positive experience because they were deployed in a relaxed way as a part of routine classroom activity. But I know that was not the case everywhere. We received clear feedback raising a number of concerns about the assessments. That feedback is a concern, particularly where the assessment of a young pupil was not viewed as a positive experience. No one wants any child to find the assessment stressful or upsetting. But in recognising that this has been the experience for a small number, and the user review does recognise the concerns expressed by EIS members and others, I think it is important to keep these matters in context. The actual number of responses to the EIS survey is relatively small, around 460 out of a total teaching population of over 51,500. And not all of those 460 responses were raising concerns. A significant number of them had positive and constructive things to say about the assessments. I'm not surprised by that. When I speak to teachers, it is clear that when the assessments are set up and run appropriately, they are a positive benefit in our education system. I accept, however, that this is the first year of a brand new system of assessments. There are clearly things that we can enhance and improve to make things better for pupils and teachers. And the user review sets out a number of positive changes that are being introduced this year. I will highlight three specific measures today. Firstly, the voice that is missing from the user review and the EIS survey is that of children and young people. We will address that by including at the end of each assessment a short age-appropriate survey for children and young people that will encourage them to give feedback on their experience. Secondly, we will also establish a P1 Practitioner Improvement Forum to share existing practice and consider how to enhance the overall assessment model in Scotland. 
Thirdly, as we planned, there will be a replenishment of about one third of the questions in all of the assessments to ensure they are appropriately assess how children and young people are performing. I'm confident that the changes we are making will enhance the experience for children and young people and improve the information available to teachers. I also want to ensure that these enhancements benefit pupils in Gaelic medium education. I've decided to, to only roll out national standardised assessment to Gaelic medium education once the relevant lessons from the user review are taken into account in their development. This means the assessments will be available in Gaelic medium education later this calendar year. There has also been some discussion recently about whether or not parents have the right to withdraw their children from the assessments. The Scottish Government and the Association of Directors of Education issued a joint statement earlier this week to provide clarity around this point. The Scottish Government and ADES see the assessments as an integral part of everyday learning in P1, P4, P7 and S3 delivered as part of the duty to provide education. In common with virtually all aspects of the Scottish curriculum and its delivery, the SNSAs are not explicitly provided for in legislation. This is in keeping with the long tradition of a non-statutory curricular approach in Scotland. This means that the assessments are not compulsory, but also that there is no legal right for parents to withdraw their children from the assessments. In fact, there is no statutory right for parents to withdraw their child from any aspect of schooling other than some parts of religious observance and instruction. So the position on standardised assessments is the same as it is on literacy and numeracy. There is no explicit statutory mention requiring a school to teach them and never have had in Scotland. But the idea this means schools are not required to teach pupils to read and write is patently ridiculous. The same is true of standardised assessments. In practice, should any parents or carers have any particular concerns about their child's participation, they should discuss this with their school. It has been the case since the introduction of the Scottish National Standardised Assessments that a child should not undertake an assessment when it would not be in their best interest to do so. Rightly, it is for teachers in discussion with parents to determine when that is the case. This position is consistent with what we have said previously in correspondence with local authorities, schools and parents. It is consistent with our joint statement with the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland and it is consistent with the recent letter from the Deputy Director of the Scottish Government Learning Directorate to Directors of Education. In relation to that letter, I want to make clear that my officials did seek a view from SOLAR, the Society of Local Authority Lawyers, about the withdrawal of children from the SNSA to confirm that our understanding was aligned with that of local authority partners. The letter from the Deputy Director of, of the Learning Director to Directors of Education set out the position as he understood it. It was sent in good faith. The substance of that letter on parental opt-outs from the assessments is consistent with our joint assessment with ADES. It is important, as the National Parent Forum of Scotland said last week, that there is a clear understanding of the purpose of the assessments for the benefits of parents and carers. These are not high stakes tests, but diagnostic assessments to support learning and teaching. Data from them will not be published or used for accountability. They are to inform learning and teaching. They are aligned to Curriculum for Excellence and at P1 are complementary to the play-based approach which is central to the early level curriculum. Children should not be prepared for the assessments. There is no pass or fail. They are not to determine whether a child has a mastery of a subject, but to help teachers determine future learning and teaching. Teachers' professional judgment of children's progress is key. The role of the assessments is to provide a consistent approach across the country to support our desire to deliver excellence and equity for all. Presiding officer, I remain committed to the assessments at all stages. The changes we have announced in the user review will help improve the system to address the concerns that were raised during the first year of operation. I'm confident that as we continue to refine and enhance the assessments, they will pre prove to be a positive experience for children and young people and provide a range of valuable information for teachers and parents.
Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak button. And I call on Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for making this statement about an issue which I think has caused considerable confusion to parents and for forwarding to us uh, the most recent letter of clarification that was signed jointly by the Scottish Government and ADES. Presiding officer, last week a letter was sent out to local authority directors of education from the Scottish Government's Dire Deputy Director, Graham Logan, and it stated that the Scottish Government had taken legal advice from the local authority's legal body, Solar, with regards to the rights of parents to withdraw their children from primary one tests. Solar, however, refuted that they had provided any such legal advice, and we learnt this morning at the Education Committee that the Scottish Government admits that it had been wrong to imply that any legal advice of this nature had been taken. So may I ask the Cabinet Secretary, did he personally sign off the letter which Mr Logan issued last week, in which the misleading information appeared? And secondly, at what stage did he become aware that a mistake had been made? Thirdly, the subsequent letter to Directors of Education that has been issued this morning says that none of the standardised tests at P1, P4, P7 and S3 are compulsory, but are part of the local authorities' duties to provide education. Given the Scottish Government's previous insistence that standardised testing is absolutely essential in order to raise attainment in our classrooms, a point with which I agree, may I seek clarification as to whether teachers are now free to decide whether or not a class of children will sit these tests and whether the results of these non-compulsory standardised tests will be used as the key measure to determine whether or not the Scottish Government is making progress or not in narrowing the attainment gap. Cabinet Secretary. Um, first of all, um, I uh, did not sign off the letter that was issued by the Deputy Director to Directors of Education, but I take full responsibility for it because I'm a Minister in the Scottish Government and it's right that I take full responsibility for it. We did not seek legal advice from Solar. Um, we discussed the legal position that we hold to, which has been consistent throughout all of the government's communication on this matter. We discussed that with representatives of the Solar organisation, but as I explained at committee this morning, an error was made by my, um, uh, in our handling of this in that we expressed a view which we believe to have been expressed by Solar, but which in fact Solar does not express such opinions. So I can only um, apologise to Parliament for the fact that that, um, a, a, for, for that, for the events that took place in that respect. But I take responsibility for it because I should take responsibility for it. But I stress the key point is that the substance of the message in the letter from the Deputy Director is the consistent substance of the government's position on this matter and it was consistent with um, other advice that the government had taken at the time. Now, in relation to the final point that Liz Smith raised with me on the, um, the issue of uh, whether classes will take forward these assessments, I've made it as clear as I possibly can do that standardised assessments are part of the routine process of learning of young people within Scottish education, just as acquiring the skills of literacy and numeracy are part of their learning experience. So the government's expectation is that pupils will undertake standardised assessments at P1, at P4, P7 and S3. But as the evidence I have marshalled in front of Parliament today makes clear, not all pupils took the assessments because teachers were able to exercise judgment about whether it was in the interests of individual pupils for them to undertake those assessments. And that is as it should be, relying on teacher judgment. And the very last point that Liz Smith raised was about um, the information that is gathered to determine whether we are closing the, the poverty-related attainment gap. As Liz Smith will know, the government set out in the uh, publication in December last year of the National Improvement Framework the measures by which we will be held to account as to whether we have succeeded in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Uh, those measures relate to the identification by teachers of the, whether or not young people have reached the levels, uh, early level, first, second or third level within our education system, within Curriculum for Excellence. So standardised assessments will essentially inform the teacher judgments, but it will not, but the, the 
the, the, the final publication does not rest exclusively on the outcome of the standardised assessments. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for early sight uh, of his statement. The uh, Education Secretary clearly missed the lesson in stopping digging when in a hole. Faced with evidence of stress on four and five-year-olds caused by these tests, testimony from teachers that they are time-consuming and of little educational worth, and a campaign by parents to boycott them, he carries on regardless. In P1, at least, they should be suspended. I believe that is the view of this Parliament, and I hope we will have the chance to demonstrate that as soon as possible. These tests do not command the confidence of teachers. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how many schools have actually replaced those old and trusted diagnostic assessments they were using, as he said, and how many have simply just added his national assessments on because he told them to and they had to uh, use them. And their purpose remains confused. The First Minister has repeatedly told us that these assessments replace the numeracy and literacy survey, that they will monitor progress in closing the attainment gap, compare school to school and authority to authority. But if they are an integral part of everyday learning, then statistically they cannot do that. So once and for all, are these diagnostic assessments or are they monitoring standards because they cannot do both? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, on the, the, the last point that Ian Gray raises, the purpose of the standardised assessments is to ensure that uh, teachers are able to use them to enhance the learning and the teaching experience of young people to identify where young people individually have particular deficiencies and challenges and where they need support. Now, the difference between that approach and the type of survey approach that Mr Gray was arguing for over the summer is that when it comes to survey information can only give us a general picture. It cannot give us a specific picture about the needs of individual young people. And I want to make sure, and this is the fundamental issue, I want to make sure our education system is equipped with information which is effectively moderated around the country so that in one part of the country we can be confident that the right standards are being applied to ensure that young people have access to an education system that is driven by excellence and equity and in another part of the country the same guarantee can be given to children, young people and their families. So the purpose of standardised assessments is to focus on the needs of individual young people to enhance learning, but then also to give teachers confidence about the moderation of standards around the country. Because only through that device are we able to have confidence that the, the levels of achievement are being delivered by young people, which demonstrates that we're closing the poverty-related attainment gap. So that is the purpose of standardised assessments. That's why they are vital, because they help us to inform the interventions that are required to support the learning and teaching of young people in Scotland. Ross Greer to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and like colleagues, I thank the Deputy First Minister for advance sight of his statement. The weight of international evidence is not behind the Deputy First Minister and his standardised assessments. In the case of primary one tests, it's quite clear that a majority of this parliament want to see them go, and sooner or later that is what we're going to vote for. Will the Scottish Government just cut its losses and scrap the testing of these primary one children? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I've, I've set out my position that I remain committed to the assessments at all levels within Scottish education because I don't want to have a situation where we don't have an opportunity at the earliest possible opportunity in a child's formal education to identify where that child may have particular learning challenges and these assessments produce very sophisticated diagnostic information about the educational challenges of young people. And I want that information to be available so that at the earliest opportunity we can act to close the attainment gap. Because I don't want to preside over an education system where the needs of children are, are left unmet. And Mr Greer consistently pursues the needs 
of ensuring that every child's needs in our system are met. And, and I respect his position. He argues for it consistently. And I'm simply trying to apply that in relation to this issue as well, whereby when young people come into our education system, they come into a play-based curriculum at the early level. I want to see them assessed on the basis of that curriculum. And if there are any educational requirements they have, I want them addressed pronto so that they are not left unaddressed and therefore the gap in their performance increases relative to other children. That's why I want standardized assessments at primary one. That's the educational rationale, which is supported by significant international evidence into the bargain. And that's why I ask Parliament to consider carefully the issues that I present today as being the justification for ensuring we have these assessments to protect the educational opportunities of children and young people. Tavish Scott to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of his statement. I must say I profoundly disagree with the contention that uh, testing five-year-old boys and girls is consistent with play-based learning. And far more importantly, in my view, nor do many educationalists or experts or multi-point teachers that I can find. And I disagree, therefore, with the assessment that Mr Swinney has just given to uh, to Ross Gear, and not only that, but in the uh, weight of evidence that he marshalled evidence early on, in the weight of evidence that we've all read on the usefulness of data, there, are, there is quote after quote after quote about whether that data actually is of any merit whatsoever. Would, so therefore, would he, can I politely suggest that he, would he not reflect uh, on that? Would he not reflect on the fact that he hasn't carried the case in terms of, of uh, four and five year old uh, girls and boys, and that the majority of the arguments, the majority of this case is actually that this is not adding uh, to uh, teachers' experience, and more to the point, will do nothing to close the gaps that we, do, that we know exist in education and desperately need to be addressed. Cabinet Secretary. On, on the final point that Mr Scott makes about whether the assessments help us in any of our efforts to close the attainment gap, I, I take a different view. Because all of the evidence that I've looked at indicates, and this drives government policy in a whole variety of different areas around early intervention, all of the evidence that I've looked at is that the earlier we can identify any challenges that are faced by young people and address them, the quicker we are taking steps to close the attainment gap. And when I've looked at the, I looked at the, uh, the assessments uh, when they were uh, in their development stage along with uh, some teachers, and I was struck by the reaction of teachers to the diagnostic information that was presented as a consequence of these assessments, which demonstrated quite clearly areas where young people required to have support to enhance their educational performance. So the assessments are an integral part of that process of trying to address the challenges and the issues that young people will face. Now, there will, of course, be divided opinions about these points. Um, there are, you know, we, we, we can all marshal a quote that says these are a good thing and a quote that says they're not a good thing. What I'm appealing to Parliament to do is to look at the role of these assessments as part of informing the improvement of learning and teaching within Scotland with a view to ensuring that teachers are equipped with all of the information they need to have to make a judgment about the educational opportunities of children and young people. And I hope Parliament will consider these issues uh, in the manner in which I've set them out today because I think they represent a very strong opportunity for us to ensure that we work with our schools around the country to take all the action we can take to close the attainment gap in Scottish education. Thank you. The opening questioners have had the opportunity to set out each of their party's positions, so I'd welcome uh, shorter questions and appropriately shorter answers as we make progress through all the rest of the statement. James Dornan to be followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary, we've heard a lot of talk about why this isn't a good idea from the opposition parties. But could you outline to us some of the suggestions you've received from these opposition parties on how we can close the stubborn attainment gap if we don't have clear and consistent evidence around our children's learning? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, oh. Obviously, there are um, a range of different interventions that the government is taking forward to close the poverty-related attainment gap through the work that we're undertaking on the Scottish Attainment Challenge and pupil equity funding. And various schools are taking a whole variety of different approaches to try to do that, some by enhancing uh, literacy and numeracy approaches, some by supporting nurture to overcome some of the challenges that young people face in their education, others by introducing 
uh, outdoor learning into the curriculum and to strengthening the experiences of young people in the outdoors. Now, obviously, there's a debate to be had about the measures and the interventions we can make to close the poverty related attainment gap. I'm interested in that debate in Parliament because it's in all of our interests to make sure that the educational opportunities of young people are fulfilled as a consequence of the actions that we take. Alison Harris to be followed by Rua Mackay. Thank you. Minister, on behalf of parents, could you just clarify whether these tests, as you've previously described them in P1, are tests as we have known them to be? And where do they stand in the context of the Scottish Government being able to decide whether Scottish schools' attainment has actually improved? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, well, the, first, the first thing is that these are um, called Scottish National Standardised Assessments. And they are not tests, they are assessments of the uh, educational issues and experience of young people which are then used to inform enhancements to learning and teaching practice. That is their purpose. Uh, from, that, um, uh, from those assessments, teachers will make a judgment about whether a young person has reached early level, first level, second level or third level. And it's that information that flows into the, um, the performance framework that I talked about in my answer to Liz Smith which will determine whether or not we are closing the poverty related attainment gap. So teachers' judgment informs the decision about whether a young person has reached a particular level and the standardised assessments will assist teachers in forming a judgment that is consistent across the country. Rona Mackay to be followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, presiding officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any information or plans to gather information regarding how confident schools are in dealing with situations where parents or carers have concerns about their child taking part in these assessments? And is there any guidance for teachers from the government on the best way to approach this? Cabinet Secretary. The, the, the government has made available guidance to um, individual schools, which sets out that um, the assessment should be undertaken in a manner that's consistent with the educational experience of young people at school. So um, on P1 assessments, for example, the assessments should be undertaken as part of a routine approach to learning. And I've seen, I saw um, some assessments been undertaken um, which were consistent with the use of um, iPad technology in classrooms, which for P1 pupils is a relatively routine uh, element of the educational experience um, and uh, teachers were deploying these assessments in exactly that fashion. Um, obviously, if a parent is in any way concerned about their young person's experience with the standardised assessment, my advice, as it has been consistently, is that they should raise those issues directly with individual schools. And as I demonstrated with the data I set out to Parliament, that 94% of um, possible assessments had been undertaken. The teacher judgment is being uh, deployed to, to, uh, to ensure that, that assessments are not being undertaken where young people are not, it's not appropriate for a young person to undertake that assessment. And that's us relying as we should do on the appropriate judgment of teachers. Short questions, short answers please. Mary Fee, followed by George Adam. When discussing the Pedagogic Med Method and Education Committee this morning, Larry Flanagan, the General Secretary of the EIS said, if we spent half the time and energy on promoting formative assessment practice in our schools, then we've spent promoting the Scottish National Standardised Assessments, we'd be in a much better place in terms of assessment practice in our schools. Given Mr Flanagan's comments, does the Cabinet Secretary not agree that more support and resourcing should be given to teachers to use the pedago pedagogic method rather than testing? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, Scottish National Standardised Assessments are formative assessments. That is what they are. That's what, that's what they are. They are designed to inform Absolutely. teacher judgment. They are not, if they, were, if they were the other type of assessments, they'd be summative. And if they were summative, then they would be high stakes testing. And that's not what they are. No. So that's the fundamental point, that these assessments contribute to teacher judgment and teachers have been supported to deploy these assessments effectively in the classroom across Scotland. George Adam to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how often assessments like these were used previously? If, as he mentioned in his statement, the majority of councils were doing their own assessments previously, was that leading to different councils using different assessments and therefore creating an unclear picture of attainment levels across the country? 
Cabinet Secretary. Obviously, different forms of assessment will create um, different, uh, will apply different standards. And what the, the key point about Scottish National Standardised Assessments is that they are aligned with Curriculum for Excellence levels. And Curriculum for Excellence levels are the judgments which I just answered to Alison Harris, are the, 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 are the judgments about whether or not we are closing the poverty-related attainment gap as part of a wider suite of information. So we need to have teacher judgment informed by these assessments to ensure we have consistent standards across the country so that whether a young pupil is going into a school in Paisley, in Mr Adams' constituency, or going into one in Perth, in my constituency, we are operating to the same standards so we can confidently say that we are delivering a system that is driven by the values of excellence and equity for all in all parts of the country. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could set out what he thinks are the exceptional circumstances where it wouldn't be in a child's best interest to do so. I know he places uh, high importance on teacher judgment, but given teachers and parents didn't ask for these tests, it'd be useful to know some examples. And also, if any assessment has been made of the 6% who haven't taken part this year to understand why not. Cabinet Secretary. Um, Mr Mundell said, uh, uh, put forward the proposition that teachers and parents had not asked for these assessments. Can I remind them that the Conservative Party did? And that's rather kind of, it's rather been missed in this whole debate. So the Conservative Party were arguing for a considerable amount of time that we needed standardised assessments across the country. Um, I don't think, well, well, Mr Mundell is saying not for P1. Um, he obliges me then to say that when the First Minister set out the programme for government in 2015, she said we will introduce new national standardised assessments for pupils in primaries one, four and seven and in the third year of secondary school. And in response to that uh, statement by the First Minister, uh, Ruth Davidson said this, I am pleased that our repeated and sustained calls for standardised assessments to be introduced in schools have been heeded. And then the Conservative Party in its manifesto in 2016 said, over the last parliament, we have pushed the SNP to accept standardised testing for, for pupils. So I, think, I don't think Mr Mundell is in a strong position to say to me that nobody wanted these things because his party actually argued for them. But having said all of that, I think it's important that teachers are left free to exercise the professional judgment in whether it is appropriate for a pupil to be involved in standardised assessments. And the data I've shared with Parliament today makes it clear that in 6% of the possible cases, that judgment was exercised and pupils did not participate. Now, we will assess. We can certainly have a look. Uh, we can certainly have a look at that 6% and see what underlies it. But what I think it demonstrates is that the necessary flexibility that should be in a system of this type to respond to the circumstances of individual young children and young people is implicit in the system. Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I welcome the statement from the Cabinet Secretary and particularly the commitment to ensure that the voices of our young people are being heard? Can the um, Cabinet Secretary expand a little bit on when the Primary One Practitioner Improvement Forum will be established and what work it will carry out? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we'll, we'll establish that uh, during this school year to make sure that we understand and hear and appreciate and respond to the issues that are raised by um, uh, P1 practitioners in their experience. Obviously, there's been a lot of experience in the first year. Um, I've set out a number of changes as part of this statement today, which we've made recognising the experience that took place in the first year of operation. My mind is not at all closed to making further changes if they are required in response to practitioner feedback. And I would be happy to engage with members of parliament on exactly how we take that forward to make sure that any improvements and enhancements that we can make uh, are improvements and enhancements that the government takes forward. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for on the statement. We've already run five minutes over. Apologies to Joanne Lamont and Willie Coffey. Uh, we will be able to hear their questions. We'll move on now to uh, a continuation of our debate on the Scottish Government's programme for government. And I would invite members who wish to speak this afternoon 
uh, to press their request to speak buttons now.